Beware of spoilers. The following podcast discusses the first Hobbit movie, Hobbit the Book, and also Lords of the Rings trilogy. Before I hand it off to AFL, our official host, I need you guys to sign a contract before we start. <laughs> so the contract is uh, Vassals of Kingsgrave to Peter, Terrard, Matt, Mandibly, and Shane. For your hospitality and sincere, uh, our sincere thanks, and for your offer of professional assistance, our grateful acceptance. Terms: cash and delivery, up to not exceeding one sixth of total profits, if any. All travel expenses guaranteed in any event. Funeral expenses to be defrayed by us or our representatives if occasion arises and the matter is not otherwise arranged for. Meals provided or not at the sole discretion of the director with due regards to availability, season or any special dietary requirements not disclosed at the outset. Podcast undertaken entirely at your own risk. Present company shall not be liable for injuries inflicted or sustained as a consequence of thereof, including not limited to lacerations, eviscerations and incinerations so do you guys all agree incinerations yeah man dragons <laughs> yeah i'll sign <laughs> yeah i agree okay. i'll agree and okay. sign that yes i'll agree <laughs> okay that's taken care of now so let's start Uh, Matt, do you want to do the intros and stuff like that? Guide the podcast, or uh... I thought you were doing it. Oh, <laughs> I was going to edit it, of course, but uh, but okay, oh, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you, you or I mean, you put together the show notes and everything, right? You, I mean, yeah, you took, okay, you took the most trouble, so yeah, sure. This will this will be a really crappy beginning then. So. <laughs> okay, um, just tell me when you when you start. Oh yeah, record is already started. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I guess we're here, we're talking about the movie and then also a little bit what the books, uh, for the first Hobbit movie, which was, uh, Peter Jackson's, uh, Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, which pretty much goes from the original Hobbit beginning, uh, the unexpected dinner to all the way to, uh, the, the Carrick where the Eagles take them. So, uh, I'm Matt. Um, also known as Eiffel on the forums. And who else is here? This is Shane, son of Michael, known as East Texas Direwolf. Hi, here I'm, I'm a small crab on the forums. Hi, I'm uh, Eddie, um, son of Peter, son of Harry. <laughs> also known as Dead Odd on the forums. Um, uh, this is Lee, son of John, uh, apparently the, the king of the interrupters, uh, also known as Lord Manderbly on the forums. <laughs> and I'm 42. Uh, podcaster under the mountain at your service <laughs> okay um so i guess i mean just to talk about the movie first uh how about everyone just go through and say i guess when they were first exposed to both the book the movie and then what their tk creating was for the unexpected journey so i'll start off um i mean i first i read the book probably when i was seven or eight when I was really young and I always really liked it and then when the movie came out I I actually thought it was really good I'm but I'm a sucker for adaptations where as long as you know it somewhat sticks to the story it's okay so I don't mind the rock'em sock'em robots and the roller coaster ride of some of the fights and everything so but I thought it was pretty good and it was keeping with you know the general experience so I'd give it about a four to four and a half um you know, it wasn't great, but, you know, it, it definitely was a really fun movie. And since it's been on HBO, I think I've seen it about five times. So on on demand. So, yeah, so, uh, I only picked up the book when I knew that there was a movie in the works and something. So I kind of read it like a couple of years before the movie actually came out. But this is like the only yeah, this is like the only Tolkien book I read. I haven't read any of the others. Uh, but after reading this, I I read one third of Fellowship of the Rings. Tried a bit of similar similarity on you know what, what uh, similar similar <laughs> And then a bit of uh, uh, Children of Durin, uh, you know. But uh, this is my favorite of all the books I tried. So yeah. Oh yeah, I would give it 
three, I have a few gripes about the movie, how some of the tone is slightly changed from the books. Uh, that's why I would give it a four. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I actually read the book and finished like when I was pretty young. I got into the Lord of the Rings through the movies at first, and I read the uh, the trilogy after that and The Hobbit after that. Um, so I don't really remember that much about the book itself, but I would give the movie uh, a four. It was really fun, and it was just great to be visiting Middle Earth again. And there were some parts that I did like, but we'll get into that later. So, yeah, definitely the four for me. Yeah, I, I I think I got the book or an audio book about ten years ago. Um, read that in Lord of the Rings a lot, and uh, love the love the original um, Lord of the Rings movies. Um, I'll give the movie about a three and a half uh, tea cakes. I, uh, it has problems, but it was very nice. I, I did like the beginning, even though some people think it's boring, because that was the mo- bit most like the book. <laughs> Let's see. I read the book probably about the yeah. time the Lord of the Rings movies were coming out. Yeah. Uh, I read the the Lord of the Rings books when I heard the movies were being made, and it was after I read those books I went and back and read The Hobbit. Also, I'd give the movie about four and a half. I really liked it. It wasn't perfect, but uh, the stuff I liked I really liked a lot, and I liked most of it. And I when I like stuff I can be pretty forgiving about the <laughs> nitpicks. Uh, me. So I read the books. Uh, well, I first heard the books when I was a little kid. My dad read them to me when I was five or six. Um, and then they were some of the first books I read on my own when I was little, too. So, But I really liked the movie. I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, I thought it was good. I'm one of those people who will basically defend anything Lord of the Rings related to the death. Um, <laughs> but I know, I really enjoyed it. My only small complaints were that it there it was... I don't know. I don't really remember them. I really enjoy it. <laughs> so, so okay. So, as all of you guys, uh, has ev- everybody gone? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Okay, I need to test your guys' credentials. Without looking at the cheat sheet that Peter just posted, <laughs> I need as Sorry. a group of all of you guys to identify all the, ho- all the you know, drops in the movie, all 13 drops. So, go on. Are we all doing them at once? Yeah, yeah, just do it as a group. I don't want to pick. By order of appearance okay. or what? Oh, oh wow, I'll, you're that confident. I'll take the huh? first one. Oh, right. Wallin was the first guy to show Wallin. up. And then Balin. Balin. Feely Keely. Feely Keely. And then they all showed up at the same time. Or <laughs> are we talking yeah. about the book? Boin, Gwine. Dory, Nori, Ori. Yeah. Boffer, Biffer, uh, and Bofer. Biffer, Bofer, and Bomber. Um, okay. Oin, Gloin, Feely Keely, Thorin, Balin, Dwalin, Gloin, Oin. Um, oh, wow. You guys got it all. <laughs> oh, man, I had so many thoughts I had to, you know, I wanted to throw at you guys for not remembering all of them, but you got them all. <laughs> ah. Well, like I said, it, it's um, before I've been I've been trying to find all the uh, Lego sets so I can collect all the drawers. And so going through each one and I'm like looking at each set, I'm like, all right, this one has, you know, Feely and Keely and that one has Bomber. And then it's. It's been a lot easier to actually be able to see one and know which one's which because I've been, you know, hunting down all these Lego sets. So, I think they're well, really I, good. Yeah, I think one I thing felt they like did, it would be hard to keep them all straight, you know. But they did. I thought they did do a good job at, you know, different. Yeah, just, well, I was gonna say I think the movie did a very good job of making them different and giving them personalities a lot better than the book did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So maybe you guys want to talk about the dwarf designs at this point. Yeah. So. What yeah. uh, dwarf did you guys like the most? Like, I I liked how they were. It was so well thought out. I mean, uh, oh. I've read a, I've read a lot of books, you know, about the making of and the costumes and stuff. So it might not be so obvious to movie watchers as it is to me. You know, I don't know. But I mean, you can tell there's even like a class system with the dwarfs. I mean, not a, just a <laughs> class system, but there's there's nobles and there's sort of merchants in there, and then there's sort of the the working class miners. Uh, oh, I, 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 oh um, most of them are related, um, I think. Um, yeah, and these are all pretty high, high-end high dwarves. I mean, Thorin's as royal as it can be, and Feely and Keely are his nephews. Yeah, Oyen and Gloin are uh, more the merchant class, though. And uh, Yeah. Was it Bomber, yeah, I think, Biffer, I think and Bofer? They're second Bofer. cousins, Barn and Dwarn are first cousins, I think. Yeah, they're... Uh, they're like miners. They and even their weapons are more like a pickaxes and things like that. Some of yeah. them, as opposed to the well, swords and the Balin and Dwalin and uh, Thorn and Keely using swords and stuff. They use their hammers and their 
Oh, what's Pickaxes. Bomber good for? <laughs> he, 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 he's a cook. It oh. was in, yeah, he uh, fights with his big ladles and spoons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's got a massive ladle and his belly. Uh, when you said class, I thought you meant, you know, a tank class, healer class, DPS class. <laughs> You play too much WoW, my friend. Yeah, that's the thing I like about this movie because when I was reading the books, these guys were going on an adventure for treasure. I was I was able to relate to them, you know. I was I could see myself among them. But the movie like changed the tone entirely. It's about home. It's about you know. It just started becoming too sentimental. It's like <laughs> what's wrong with greed? What's wrong with just doing it for gold? <laughs> Well, I think that has to do kind of with just the way that Tolkien wrote, wrote it, though, because, you know, the first couple chapters, it is about just a treasure chest. Like, they don't even talk really about how um, Thorin is the king and everything else like that. Mm-hmm. For the most part, you know, the focus is on the treasure, and it's not until they get really to Lake Town that they start ta- that they start bringing up the king under the mountain and everything else like yeah. that. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of it's that, like, for all their... They're dwarves. They're not like big romantic elves or something like that. They're like, they want their stuff. Yeah. Like, it's important that, Thor, like, what Thorin wants is to be king again. Because uh, Did you cut out a bit of that just me? Sorry, I think I'm going to, yeah, I cut out for a second. I was just saying Thorin considers his throne, like, every bit as much a possession as all of his gold. Um, yeah, but I, saw, I really liked all the costume design. I know some purists were irked because they thought it was cartoony, but I thought it was like, cool and clever and fun and not distracting and a good way of keeping them apart because like i don't know i the, i remember the hobbit animated movie it was impossible to tell who was who <laughs> yeah, they were mostly identified by the beard beard and cloak colors weren't they yeah. yeah and that's like harder to keep straight i don't know i i thought it was fun i also what was the thing come on brain you can handle this yeah i didn't know about the class thing that's really cool so um you guys seen any of the extended cuts or special edition, like extra material or like videos about the design or anything like that. I haven't seen them personally, but I've uh, kept up with the of production. This or of the original Lord of the Rings No, this one. I mean, hasn't the ah. like the extended cut come out already on DVD and Blu-ray? Or... Yeah, I yeah. haven't seen the extended cut though. But I've but on YouTube on Peter Jackson's YouTube channel, he posts his uh, production diaries and everything, and those were super detailed, right? Uh, he talks about the cameras he's using. He talks about the frame rate thing and everything. Those are really good. But I haven't seen the Blu-ray extended stuff. No, I was yeah. more talking about the sort of lore stuff, like the class systems for the dwarves and designs and that. I remember, like, the Lord of the Rings ones, they had a lot of like, concept art and design philosophies and stuff like that. I mean, I think Shane talked about uh, extended cuts a little bit earlier. Or... Yeah, I haven't watched the uh, supplemental materials. I've just watched the extended cut, and I watched it with the commentary with Peter Jackson. So oh, I haven't right. watched all the behind-the-scenes the sc- behind stuff. Yeah, there's yeah, like a, a three-hour... Is it good? Oh. It's the extended edition? Yeah, it's pretty I'm good. a huge fan of the extended editions of the originals, but I've been They're, I'm a bro- yeah, so I haven't been able to watch yet. Yeah, I loved the extended Lord of the Rings movies, and this one isn't quite as good as those. It's there's a few extra scenes. There's not a whole lot of extra. Um, well, there's an extra extended version. It's called Movie Three. <laughs> what, what, what do you guys think about breaking this stuff into three movies? I mean, uh, is it justified? Or is it the middle of the cash cow? Yeah, I feel... I, they've got so much to put in. Um, yes. Because the, the whole journey takes over a year, which is the same time as the journey in Lord of the Rings took. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. There's, I think there's plenty of material yeah. there. And isn't the third yeah, movie supposed to like take a lot of stuff from the appendixes and not just the, like the, the Hobbit yeah, itself, yeah. but expand on that quite a bit? I mean, it's yeah. the Battle of the Five Armies that's supposed to be in the third one, right? Not the next one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the previews, the previews for Desolation yeah. of Smog look like they're going pretty far into the Hobbit book. Yeah, I I'm thought they were gonna sh- end I'm near the battle escape thing, but it looks like we're gonna see Smog and everything. They even showed the Bard in the trailers, right? Yeah, I think Smog dies in the second movie. I think it's yeah, gonna be the really, end of it or the beginning of the um, third. Um, and I think that they're. But yeah, if Smog no, dies in the, in the in the but if Smog dies in the second movie, that doesn't leave much for the third movie. It's only going to be no, like the it, Battle of the Five Armies then. Yeah, but the Battle of Five Armies has a huge amount of build up because there's also the the potential battle between the elves and the dwarves. 
Yeah, there's a standoff and the men of Dale. Yeah, I mean, that's at least... That's at least okay. up until and then to the end of the battle is at least an hour, hour and a half. Yeah, and you guys, okay, guys uh, uh, just, uh, as I said, I haven't read the books in a while, so, or the book. So can you just uh, list the five armies? It's dwarves, elves, and... Dwarves, yeah, elves, golems, elves, elves and eagles, men, goblins, the wild. <laughs> eagles are counted as an army. What the fuck? I think no. that's what the fifth army is, though, in the five. Yeah, the eagles are counted as an army. You also have to add... Like Bilbo's betrayal and his whole relationship with, t- with Thor. Yeah, exactly. That's why I think it's. I think Smog dies at the end of the second movie because otherwise, if they save Smog's death, Battle of the Five Armies, and everything they want to add with the Necromancer for the third movie, it's going to be terrible. It would defeat the purpose of stretching it out into three movies entirely. So Benedict Cumberbatch is playing is is the voice of the dragon, and he's also playing the Necromancer, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. he is. Isn't the necromancer like Sauron, but he's in, in a diminished form or something? Yeah, they don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So in the books, they actually did, but they called him the necromancer. If you read all the extended stuff. Well, but, uh, that's because Tolkien never hadn't actually made him up yet. I right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I actually thought that they would be they would finish up with the necromancer stuff at the end of the second one, and that way they can have Gandalf then show up for the third one that would so. make sense then you had then you have smog and the necromancer as the main villains in the second thing and then the oh. third is all about the battle of five armies and the return yeah. oh so that's what gandalf was doing when he sends these guys off into the murkwood and leaves them there he's actually going back to fight the necromancer yeah, yeah. Ah, i was Him like and- such a douchebag he's leaving them at the most hardest <laughs> part of the journey like what an asshole and, uh, and that's gonna and, involve uh, uh, like galadriel the white council i think a bunch of uh, other people are going to... It's going to be a big part of the either end of the second or third movie. Yeah. Well, we, they wouldn't have gotten any XP if Gandalf was with them, so he had to leave them <laughs> at Mercury. <laughs> yeah. That's what I love about The Hobbit, that it's such their whole quest is so petty. Like, they end up doing a lot of good and setting a lot in motion, but it's like they're just on their chill quest, kind of ignoring all the important shit around them. Yeah. Well, I think that's the kind of the genius of Gandalf, right? He's the, you know, the... The chess player, he sees all the pieces, and so he plays the long game. Because he he kind of he knew there had to be, he wanted there to be, you know, that if there was a kingdom up north to help with the coming troubles. Because that played the there's it's hardly in the Lord of the Rings at all, but that's a huge part of the War of the Ring is what goes up on up north uh, with Erebor. Yeah. And, and just yeah. getting rid of the dragon too. I mean, it's so, so you mean to say uh, Gandalf is the middle finger of. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I think I think the reasoning behind it was if the dragon was still there at the time of the Lord of the Rings, um, he could have just um, there would have been an orc army and with a dragon to head it, and it would have swept all the way west in northern parts. So it would have sacked Rivendell, um, gone all the way to the havens where the ships go, uh, where the uh, where the elves leave. So the elves wouldn't be able to leave basically because they would have destroyed that. Yeah. Uh, I mean. In the film, uh, in the sort of White Council scene, they talk about if Smog was sort of convinced to join the enemy, there would be a, like a huge bonus for them. But is there like precedent for dragons being in the forces of evil, like on under Sauron or Morgoth? Or is yeah. that sort of yeah, ooh, it's so brilliant. Yes, can I get this? You go ahead. Yep. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so, so uh, to, to hop into intense lore here. Um, yeah, essentially, back in the old days, in the Silmarillion days, when the high, in like Galadriel and Elrond's era, high elves, all that shit, before Numenor even, um, but when Sauron's boss was the big bad guy, um, people, dragons, Sauron, and a few other evil spirits, and Balrogs were essentially his like uh, deputies, his lieutenants, and they were all pretty much equal. Uh, sorry, sorry did, did I cut out? Yeah, I did cut out. Yeah. Should we? Where? You you stopped at Balrog and the lieutenants were all equals or something. Oh, okay. So uh, Sauron is this was the scariest of his lieutenants because he was the most clever. Um, but like the Balrogs and the dragons were every bit as destructive and hard to kill and intelligent. They were just a little bit less uh, nimble. Like Sauron's convincing and tricky as well. Yeah, he was a shape. So yeah, having like yeah, but people like Smog and like the old Balrogs. 
they're not on Sauron's side bas- at this point, basically because they're like, they, why would they listen to someone who used to be their, their equivalent? Um, and after the big bad guy was destroyed. Yeah, uh, gotta go again. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's my, my internet. I, yeah, it, I'm sorry. It's the internet here. It's not great. Um, yeah, I think there are just too many people <laughs> well, on the call, up. so this is making it a bit more No, tricky. this yeah, happens yeah. to me, whoever I Skype with. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. Ba- basically, just Sauron, they don't want to work for Sauron because they he's like a co-worker, and they don't want to be let him be in charge. But if they did decide to, it would like double his sort of scariness. So they're like wild cards. Yeah. Like if if Real Sauron and like if Sauron is like stronger than the whole council together, and like it or like they're roughly equivalent, maybe then like where someone like Gandalf barely took out a Balrog, like it would take <laughs> it would take yeah, equivalent again, strength to take out a dragon. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Someone else should <laughs> stop um, talking. And, Sorry. And yet, and yet one that element was that was good. We we can. Um, no, that that's right. I mean, it's like they were, but dragons did work for Morgoth, who was uh, yeah, sort of Melkor. Yeah, so, um, he they they were like his, you know, some of his lieutenants and everything. And so, I I don't know. I would think that Sauron would at least use Smog in some kind of way. It, he may not be, yeah. but because Sauron's so tricky and everything, I think he would be able to convince Smog. Not to work for him, but just to be like, "Hey, I'm creating chaos. Why don't you go create some chaos here?" Yeah. And you know, he could easily smog taking out Rivendale is not that hard to see. Yeah. And so that was, was also, yeah. yeah. And I mean, even if all he does is perch there in the north, keep the dwarves out of one of their ancestral fortresses, and lock up a whole bunch of Mirkwood elves and men, nor- men of Dale and Iron Hill dwarves from like doing other shit, like that would make a big difference. So you guys like it then? You guys like that the Hobbit movie is so connected to the other books? Uh, oh. You know, I mean, you don't see it as its own separate entity. This is Bilbo's adventures and stuff, and that's something else. You like you like that Peter Jackson's brought so much of the three movies or the three books into this one. Yeah, I think it's kind of necessary, really, because uh, the Hobbit was sort of this kind of more like fun, lighthearted rom for kids and. Uh, uh, he opened the door for Lord of the Rings when he made those movies first. So he sort of had to work in that world and do the things that... I mean, most of this stuff with the necromancer and that, that comes from the appendixes, doesn't it? Not really yeah. like the yeah, it does. actual book. So he sort of has to expand on that to keep it consistent with the world he has already created. Yeah. Well, and Tolkien did the same thing. I mean, after writing Lord of the Rings, he, he went back and tried to rewrite The Hobbit and then he mm. wrote all the appendixes and this, everything else, trying to tie those two worlds together and yeah. make that yeah. a little bit make a little bit more sense. He did some so, retconning. Yeah, some heavy retconning. So uh, I like the way that it's explained, it, though. Oh, sorry. I was just because I like the way it's Tolkien did that by uh, explaining that Bilbo, because the Hobbit is is it's the story is told by Bilbo. So right. the discrepancies he sort of wrote off as Bilbo, the ring's corrupting influence on Bilbo as he fudged a few of the details. Yeah, that's a great, great thing. So, Or Bilbo yeah. just didn't know what was going on. So, <laughs> Also possible. Yeah. I also, yeah. I really like that. I feel like uh, one of the best strengths of The Hobbit is that it's this very, like, it feels like a kid's, I don't know, it feels like you go from The Hobbit to Lord of the Rings and it gets so much more serious and intense, but it kind of feels like it's not because the world. Ah, uh, you cut out, Lee. Come on, it goes again. <laughs> uh, uh, it's I can not see it when I freeze my. Oh, because the world itself, your your the world itself isn't getting darker. It's not like a change in perspective. It's just a change in your perspective on it. It's a change on whose eyes you're looking through. Like Bilbo has a much more sweet, silly look on the world than I don't know than the 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 whole fellowship. Also, yeah, when it freezes, I can see it because my little clock stops counting, but. Ugh. God, I cannot wait to have good internet again. <laughs> yeah, I almost wonder what it would have been like if the Hobbit was told from, you know, Thorin's or Balin's point of view. You know, if the tone would have been completely different. Because it's not, you know, this Hobbit going on his first adventure, but it's more Thorin being like, we need to go through this, you know, 
we're wasting all this time in all these other places. I hate elves. Let's keep going. <laughs> and every other thing is really a really interesting thing. Over their lost glory or something. And I kind of read somewhere that actually uh, Tolkien identified himself more to more like a hobbit, right? I mean, he likes good food, he likes smoking his pipe, he likes his gardens and stuff like that. So it's probably easier for him to write as a hobbit than as a dwarf or something. Yeah, he says in yeah. the uh, prologue for the uh, for the Fellowship of the Ring that he uses the hobbits because even though there are men in the world, what we would relate to more is hobbits. And so, like their mannerisms and everything else. So he, you know, he doesn't see us. He doesn't see people, you know, nowadays relating to the men of the world, men of his world, but more of the hobbits. So yeah, yeah that's, that thought has been sort of passed down to Peter Jackson as well, because he, from what I read, he bought the Hobbit set, the man-sized version, and he said so he's gonna put it in a hill somewhere and retire there someday. So. <laughs> He probably <laughs> identifies with the Hobbits more too. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's got the sets in storage, has not he? Yeah. yeah. Well, they left the when they built the Hobbit. They built Hobbiton out of permanent materials this time in New Zealand, so it's there for people to go see. Oh yeah, really? It's That's like a true. theme park now, I think. I mean, not proper theme park, but more like a you know walk along theme park thing. Not with oh, roller yeah, coasters I'm, and stuff. I mean, it's become a huge tourist industry for New Zealand, hasn't it? Since the trilogy, so that makes sense, yeah. So um, we've talked a lot about the sort of heavy lore stuff here, but uh, maybe we want to go back to the movie a little bit. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys want to talk about the bits you liked and the bits you didn't like maybe a bit? So how about we talk about, briefly talk about the the new technology stuff, you know, did that impress you guys? The fast frame uh, rates and stuff yeah. like that? Did anybody see it in the um, high frame rate? Right? I, I saw it at the high frame yeah, rate. Yeah, exactly. There's only about five screens in the UK, so I didn't. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't available around yeah. anywhere close to me. Oh, really? Okay. I, I saw it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I didn't really... It's uh, it's it initially, especially the first part, first half an hour of the movie when it was still taking place in Hobbiton, it definitely felt a lot like a TV show, a lot like a soap opera or something, you know, just some just seemed brighter and everything. But then when they were off in the world, then it felt a bit like a regular cinematic and everything. I I don't know, it wasn't too impressive for all the fuss they made about it, all the hype they created. It wasn't, you know, I would have a regular technology would have been fine i think i'll still watch the next movie in high frame rate uh because it's just different uh but yeah it's not like something special yeah, i think i saw it in yeah, that new frame rate but i didn't really notice the difference it's uh yeah. maybe i'm not that much yeah. of a movie buff or something yeah so okay let's uh talk about the movies then uh the favorite parts and the least favorite parts okay um I really liked the uh, Riddles in the Dark scene and the, the first 40 minutes or so um, in Bill Boy's house. <laughs> uh, those those bits were, well, pretty as as true to the book as they could probably get. Um, the Azog thing, I, I don't know why they couldn't just use Bolg for it. Because well, they, got, they got Conan, what's his face, uh, the first mountain uh, from season one of Game of Thrones. There and, was a uh, Manu Bennett plays the Zog, the guy from Spartacus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw, I saw. Actually, I saw in the extended features um, that they actually tried. That, that was actually the third version of uh, Azog. Mm. Um, they tried. They, they tried one. I think they tried Bolg, and it didn't work. And then they tried Azog as like a really old creepy guy, and that didn't work. So they then they uh, came up with the white guy. Mm. Yeah, I think well, uh, Jessica on the forums called him a penis monster, so I don't know how <laughs> successful they were in that. So, yeah. On so the commentary, the... they say they said the reason Peter Jackson said the reason they went with a Zog instead of Bolg was because they wanted to do the flashback, and they thought it would have been strange to introduce a Zog in the flashback, and then kill him and say, okay, now the bad guy is his son, you know, uh-huh. who's chasing uh-huh. the hobbits, and so they just decided. Oh, uh-huh. okay. That makes sense. Now I've been. I've been racking my brain trying to figure this whole thing out. Like the fact that they would go so far off the storyline and everything. But that actually makes a lot of sense. But doesn't that sort of slightly yeah, decrease Thorin's badassery? So he just cut off his arm. like, And that was it. He didn't mm-hmm. slay the general. Well, of the in, um, in that battle, um, Dane's supposed to kill 
Yeah, yeah. Dane oh, killed Dane Iron Foot. Uh, yeah, like Dane, the Dane that's guy. how he gets Iron Foot the name. <laughs> Does and it kick him to death? I found it. What? I found it really strange that um, uh, in that really rocky landscape, um, Torin just happens to find an oaken branch <laughs> just lying around. Peter Jackson actually brought that up on the commentary. He said he hoped yeah. nobody noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he failed. I, I thought it was like a fossilized uh, oak or something because you know his regular this, shield broke uh, when Azog slammed at it, but this oaken branch didn't. So I, I was thinking maybe it's like fossilized, a prehistoric oaken branch or something. Uh-huh. Or maybe that's sort of more of Tolkien's sort of anti-industrialist sort of view, how he sort of yeah, that's what I was thinking. Wanted to be. like like with Saruman, he's burning the woods and making metal and stuff like that so yeah yeah that's another one of Tolkien's uh that why he's a hobbit like hobbits are they're industrious but they're not industrial if that makes sense yeah it hobbits are dwarf hobbits hobbits, hobbits are industrious i mean all they want to do is eat and sleep and smoke no, 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 and no, no, stuff sorry, they right? they're they're <laughs> They're industrious. Like they work. They, they actually work really hard. Um, they're very clever with their hands. They 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 have like very fertile farm and happy life. They're also they just they're just not very ambitious. Yeah, they're craftsmen. They, they use tools and they have crafts. Things. That's a perfect word. But all the tools that they use are not tools that would replace a person, but are tools that a person couldn't use. So like they have hammers, they have bellows, they have, you know, windmills, that kind of stuff. But even when you think about it, the windmills, yeah. you know, who was running the windmills, but the millers and the millers were the bad, were the bad hobbits. So like they were using, they would use tools, but they would only use tools yeah. for things that, you know, a person couldn't do. And so mm-hmm. they're industrious. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a great example. So. I think you can see a Thanks. bit of that. They're like, the- I mean, when, um, Tolkien describes orcs later on in the Lord of the Rings. He says that they make useful things, but they don't make beautiful things or something like that. Mm-hmm. And hobbits yeah. do make beautiful things. Um, i got to agree with Ed here that um, I really like the Reels in the Dark scene. That was probably one of the best in the movie. And also I really oh, like the prologue. Amazing. Yeah, I love some the prologue the, also. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, uh, relating to the prologue, I noticed that there actually weren't any humans in this film, despite... Um, uh, if you discount the prologue, you have the men of the dale there. But apart from that, you just have Gandalf and his wizards. So you just have, have dwarves and hobbits and elves. I hadn't thought of that, yeah. Yeah. Kind of neat. But there are, well, there aren't many men in the, in that bit of the north. Um, it's just Bree, but they didn't think go there. <laughs> yeah, they go and, straight north from Hobbiton, or like. yeah, and the rangers knocking about. Oh, and also the um, the whole. Um, Ring rays being locked up. I didn't really like that. The what? Uh, the, you uh, know, the ri- they say the ring rays were locked away. Uh, um, oh yeah, the after, witch king. After, yeah, after the witch king got beaten for the first time. Yeah, the the tombs of the Nazgul. Yeah, which we're probably going to see in the next movie. Yeah. So that's not canon, is it? No. No. No, it's not. No. All right. So, uh, my favorite parts were uh, like love the riddle in the dark scene. I love the prologue and the the flashback to the battle uh, outside of Moria. Did y'all notice? Uh, like, I love seeing Balin in the the flat in the prologue flashback, and then Dwalin. Did y'all see him with his big mohawk in the battle yeah, outside yeah. of Moria? Yeah. yeah, that was cool. Yeah, uh, I think Dwalin was my favorite dwarf out of them all. It's just this big yeah. bruiser, and he's the fish's yeah. head and all the. Yeah, and yeah, I, I think really Dwalin with his stories too. and everything. Yeah, <laughs> I really yeah, like Rad- <laughs> Radagast the Brown also. <laughs> oh, I hated him. He was just... That's what I, I mean, a lot of people do. I liked it. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> I mean, he's sort, sort of like... I thought, I, mean, was, he, I thought he was silly. You know what I, I liked just, about him was he was he was kind of silly. He, you know, he played one of the doctors in Doctor Who, and he had that Doctor Who quality of kind of being silly, but he could turn and be, you know, kind of hard too. Like, he faced the... the what, the King of Angmar, right? The, yeah. It was a, the shadow of him or whatever, but he still faced him and beat him. And then, you know, he was yeah. those orcs. He wasn't scared. He was like, let him try to, you know, f- find me or chase me. And then, boom, he was off. Yeah, I liked him too. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people got upset about it, but there's no, no one knows what he is about. Like, because there's no description of him. You know, he, he's brought up a couple of times in conversation. So the fact that Jackson could do anything with him, and I thought he did pretty well, um, you know, worked out really well. 
And then I, I actually, I was really surprised that we saw the battle outside of Moria as an Ozil, as an Ozil Um despite all of like, you know, the things that were changed and everything. I really liked how, you know, you went from, you went from Aramor and you saw the, all the drawers that were really young and you got to see them age pretty much. Like you saw, you saw Dwalin when, you know, he had, you know, brown hair and then, you know, he slowly Mm -hmm. slowly goes white and, and Balin's like Mohawk. Like you said, that was really good too. So that was my favorite. That was my favorite. Thorns aged very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. yeah, I think that's um, one of the points I wanted to bring up. That Thorin was sort of made into this sort of more of an action hero kind of guy than he was in the book. He's sort of yeah. uh, maybe to feel that sort of Aragorn spot that yeah. they didn't well, really have. He's, he's kind of action heroy in the book too. He's just a dick. <laughs> well, he's also really old in the book. Yeah, he's yeah. the oldest. He's the oldest one. He, yeah, he's like two hundred and sixty. Yeah. Yeah, he does say he's hundreds of years old or something. Yeah. yeah. He was just a kid during when uh, when the when the uh, when the mountain fell right to smog, but in yeah. here is like a full grown man who even fights and stuff. Yeah, yeah but he had a longer beard then, didn't he? Was there something that he was shaving it out of shame or something like that? Yeah, I think <laughs> I think I heard the actor or somebody say that that, that was his <laughs> rationale for him oh, having yeah. a short beard. Oh yeah. He um. Because in the prologue, he had sort of like a, a little bit of a longer beard. It was like tied up. Uh, but um, I think in one of the features, he said um, he read a line that the uh, dwarves en- uh, fled the mountain with singed beards. So uh, he, he obviously, his beard was obviously singed off uh, by the dragon. And uh, I think he said, oh, he, he won't grow it back till uh, he's uh, king under the mountain again. or something." So like it's that. a Dothraki Ooh. thing. Then, <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, sorry, really love that uh, little bit of the prologue scene when uh, Thorin is sort of shown that he has to work the forge as a, at a human's town or something. He's just hammering away, obviously angry at the anvil there. That's really cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I, I feel... kind of. Yeah, go on, Lee. Oh, no, no, go for it, Vikram. No, no, I got to say, I favorite part, like favorite part, except for the prologue, uh, kind of didn't have much favorite parts. Uh, just, uh, yeah, the go on. Oh, I was just saying, for me, I had two favorite parts. Prologue, Riddle in the Dark. No, three. Prologue, Riddle in the Dark, and the dinner party. They all <laughs> pretty perfectly brought to life those parts of book or appendix. Uh, yeah, for, for the dinner party, I sort of uh, I just, felt, a, felt a little bit embarrassed during it with the song and all. I was like, well, I watched with my brother. I uh, watched the original Lord of the Rings movies with my brother when I was a kid, and but he wasn't that into them, uh, and he hasn't read the books or anything. So I brought him to watch the movie with me. And when I, the dinner party scene, when the, these are the things that Bilbo Baggins' hate song came on, I was just sort of embarrassed and like oh god what yeah did I right it's just into? so <laughs> i love so, that song it's just so out of place right i mean i mean it's in the books it's dead but these days in a, in like transformer movie you don't you don't expect them to break into a song in middle of a movie right <laughs> yeah uh, i guess it's through the books but yeah it was kind of seen, i don't know yeah. yeah i don't think that one was in the books yeah for me it doesn't feel out of place yeah, because we knew about it, we were expecting it and everything, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's partly expectation, but it's also that it really feels like it's the, that is the tone of The Hobbit. It's goofy, and it's the dwarves are silly sometimes, and they're also kind of ridiculous. Like, like elves have such grace, but the dwarves, even when they're right, are kind of, they can be jerks, and they can be absurd. And I like that, it's fun. Yeah, I mean, I think that sort of thing, when there are all, all this sort of, great noble warrior dwarves in there like Dwalin and Thorin and to a lesser extent his nephews and uh, they sort of try to be like this stoic and grim and cool and all that but in the end they just sort of get they're these bumbling idiots like during the troll scene they all get like put in sacks anyway even though they are supposed to be these like noble guys and then when Thorin tries to charge yeah. Azok it just gets knocked down and has to be saved by a hobbit there so it's sort of diminishes their badassery in a way. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah I didn't like that part. Uh, that uh, the Bilbo coming up and uh, him coming up and de- defending uh, uh, Tron, Tron like that, just kind of was yeah, off. I, yeah. That I agree about. That felt really out of the tone for me. 
And they use the exact the... same shot there. I mean, during the troll scene when they're about to eat Bilbo, or the dwarves come out of shot like yelling battle cries and start hacking at the trolls. And they use the exact same sh- shot during when Azag is menacing over Thorin, and they just the dwarves come from the right and try to like fight them off. So it's kind of jarring to me, at least. I felt like it um, kind of put in perspective yeah. how great Gimli is. I, I... Because, you know, before this, the only exposure we had to the dwarves, at least movie-wise, was Gimli. You know, and it, you know, he's off there, you know, counting off, you know, the skulls of people that he's killing and everything. And then it goes through and it shows, like, these bumbling dwarves and everything. So I thought it just showed that, you know, Gimli is, you know, this much higher, you know, much better dwarf than these guys were. And it, and it kind of just shows that these dwarves might be over their head, you know, trying to do this thing. And what are they going to do with the dragon and everything? That's so. not a bad point. Mm-hmm. Um, that's yeah, it's just in the starting of the movie with the prologue with the Battle of Moria and everything. They kind of built up the drops and now these guys I couldn't even take on uh, three trolls or something. So they kind of like just, you know, what are they? Are they good or are they bad? <laughs> Decide. <laughs> well, I think that's the thing no, is you know, that was an army that, took, that went to Moria. And one of the things from that was most of the dwarven soldiers, the, all the warriors were pretty much killed off. And so during the dinner scene, they talked about it. It's like they're merchants and they're, you know, and they're and they're blacksmiths and everything. So they're not they're not as prepared, you know, when they're when they're being chased around by the wards. uh, It took three of them to kill that one goblin. And I think it just shows that, you know, they're in a pretty bad place because they, they really only have three experienced warriors and then two other ones. That are, you know, yeah. Feely and Keely are young and they're, they can be good, but, you know, they're inexperienced. So, mm. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, they have to have an army <laughs> when it's agree. a battle I, of the five armies. That... They have to have like a hardened battle force to show up there. So, well, I guess they handled that one. Yeah, but that's a that different one. That's, yeah. that's a but that's different the army. It's not. Any, not uh, that's, yeah, that's Billy Connolly's uh, army. It's the dwarves of the Iron Hills. So they're not. They're like distant relatives um, who haven't been decimated by dragon. Mm. And, th- and those are the dwarves that in the beginning when they when Thorin, you know, comes back and they ask if they're going to help him. And he says no. So they're going to have to do it themselves. That's why they look so dejected, because, you know, if the Iron Hills had helped them out in the beginning, this quest would have been a lot easier. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But but that's actually not in the book, right? I mean, in the, yeah. book, in the book, do they it's ask a, for... In the movie, they ask for help from the other dwarves, but in the book, it's just them 13, right? I don't know. No, I'm pretty sure they ask for help and are refused. Yeah, I'm, I think that happens. Huh. I, I kind of just read, reread it just over the last few days. I don't remember that happening, but maybe, maybe, okay. But I think the book is like that. The book is pro Hobbit, you know. I mean, you know, Bilbo is the hero. He's the one who saves them from the spiders. He's the one who saves them from the wood elves. He's the one who discovers the smog secret. So it's kind of before Bilbo, everybody seems weak. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of these scenes where the dwarves are bumbling idiots. They're sort of manufactured to give Bilbo a chance to sort of show his, show his heroism. There's a, yeah. I think yeah, and, speaks and, and, material and, and Gandalf puts so much faith in them, right? I mean, I just remember reading this scene again when uh, he leaves him at the Mirkwood and he says, you guys are in good hands. I'm leaving you Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> <laughs> Bilbo Baggins, he's not like a big epic boy. <laughs> but I, I guess he wanted yeah. to show that bronze is not everything. Muzzle isn't everything. You know, sometimes you want to be quick and cunning and stealthy and stuff like that. So Yeah, that's the whole point of The Hobbit, that like these heroes are like goons most of the time that like oh, I'm sorry you got cut out like, I cut out again didn't <laughs> yeah. I yeah you cut out at yeah. when you said just without Bilbo's stuff. cleverness no I was just saying that without Bilbo's cleverness they would never get anywhere that's why like I like that the dwarves get beat up by Thor uh, by the trolls I like that the dwarves are like not always super confident I didn't like that like Bilbo saved them from Azog or Bolg because yeah it's yeah. It defeats the purpose. Instead of having Bilbo save them with cleverness again and prove that like these guys are like not as smart as they think they are, they have they're making Bilbo into the one who does the like 
classically brave thing, which is sort of the opposite. Yeah, he's the tricky one. He's not the guy who's like standing face to face with his foe. He's like the stealthy rogue kind. He's going to backstab exactly. and things like that. Not. Well, well, so again, the... for a movie, you're going to have to have some <clears throat> of that, and you need to show some growth with Bilbo. And it's 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 hard to show, you know, courage through cleverness you know, for that. And, Bil- and Bilbo didn't really save him. Uh, he he defended him for a few seconds and gave him a few more minutes. But it wasn't like Bilbo fought him off and, you know, they're like, all right, we're okay now. Yeah, he almost showed the dwarves, hey. Yeah, but it still felt unnecessary to me. Yeah, I, I can see that. Um, yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I was very impressed with Bilbo's swordsmanship in the reels and dark scene <laughs> when he was holding off Gollum and <laughs> in the scene with the burning trees. Yeah, he was very elegant and graceful, definitely. <laughs> oh, definitely. Well, I do think one of the extended scenes showed him playing with swords as a youth so <laughs> yeah he was it but he was attacking gandalf with a wooden sword which yeah. strangely looked exactly like sting which right the, which i thought was sword cool. he gets in the end yeah okay uh let's yeah. see uh, uh was it you matt who put in this where the draft sexualized <laughs> i did put that in <laughs> that was me actually <laughs> i mean that actually sounds really dirty now that I read it back, but uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I meant that were like Philly and Killy made to be like sexy and sort of. I mean, with Killy, I can definitely see that he was sort of like putting as eye candy for the ladies there. I mean, look at him; he's like straight out of a fashion magazine or something. Like, he's got. A, I like that they did that though. Yeah, I mean, I think. It, I mean, I don't. Killy, he just doesn't look like a dwarf to me, really. He just looks yeah. like a guy that they put in there. Well, they are the younger. Yeah. They are the youngest well, they, dwarves. Yeah, they they tried. Um, they did try putting more dwarfy makeup on him. Uh, he had a full beard and all that. They said they could, he couldn't express enough or something that stuff on or something like that. Well, okay. Sure. What about Feely then? I mean, Feely, he looks like a dwarf, but does he have any makeup on? Is that his real nose over there, right? But I think uh, in the dwarf world, uh, Bom- Bomber is the real hottie, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He gets all the ladies. Yeah. Well, I think in the second one, there was rumors that, like, Feely... It's either Feely or Keely will try and, like, flirt with Toriel or something. So, like, one uh, of them... It's Keely. Like, um, in the extended edition, they... At Rivendell, they had a little scene where he was going... Uh, the, the elves were, like, playing music and all that, and he was, like, winking at the girls. Yeah. And all that. So, and then this... And one went behind him and said, this one's all right. And it's like... And they turn up to it, and he's a bloke. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, one's a flirt, you know. That that's expected out of you know thirteen drawers. So. Well, I mean, I just got that feeling from Killy and Bofor too that they just didn't look like dwarfs to me. I mean, they don't look sort of stocky enough. That just like these actors put in the movie. Like, I mean, I love mm-hmm. Bofor's character and his lines, but he's just um he's just I don't know this James Nesbitt guy, but just sort of seemed to me like he was just sort of thrown in there. I mean, we got this great actor. Let's just put him in there and. Let him, let him do his thing and like uh, he just they just put in like a little mustache on him and nothing like too serious his face is pretty slim not dwarfish to I don't me know if I agree well they were all in body suits and the gloves to they weren't you know exactly thin or anything yeah but his face is just doesn't look like a dwarf to me <laughs> I mean yeah Need I, I can see that Hmm. Okay, let's see. Shall we go on to the uh, predictions part or expectations for the next movie part? Yeah, sure, why not? Okay, so uh, so let's see. Uh, what are you guys most... Well, let's let's start with the predictions, I guess. Uh, where do you think the movie's going to end? All oh, right, we already discussed it, right? Smog's going to die in the next movie, at least. I don't think that's going to happen. I think Smog is like... Bilbo's going to finish either his probably his second trip down and it's going to be the trip where smog then leaves and crashes into the mountain and traps the drawers. And then the draw, and then you like the, I see the ending scene is smog going towards Lake town in some kind of doom. You think that's the end of the second movie? I think so because I, well, I think, I think, um, because the smog dying is kind of anticlimactic, right? He is a bard who shoots an arrow and it hits his heart and dies. It's very simple. Uh, so yeah, they, they got to keep him for the third movie. I mean, I mean, you guys predicted that the necromancer is going to be dealt in 
dealt with in the second movie as well. I mean, they have to keep a villain for the third movie, yeah. I think. And that's that's how yeah. I feel. It's like you, you finish up the necromancer plot, and then at the last part you have Smog heading towards Lake Town. So then the third one would be, you know, Smog dying, Battle of Three Armies, Battle of Five Armies, Bilbo's betrayal, and everything else that goes with that. It seems like a lot. I mean, it could, it could I could see it easily, you know, Smog dying in this, at the end of the second one, but... I would think that we would see in the previews more images of the battle for Lake Town, which you don't really see. Yeah, you see the bard so. and everything. You see the bard with his bow and arrow and all that. Oh, what is he going to use the arrow for? <laughs> well, I think... Oh, one thing I'm... Go ahead, Shane. I was just going to say, he's never really ended the movies, any of the these four movies that they made so far, in a to-be-continued kind of way. He's kind of given it a climax, and that seems like... To mm. smog leaves would be kind of to be continued. Yeah. That's, I think what I think it's going to end with smog dying, and then it's going to begin with agree. the dealing with the necromancer, and then the third movie will end with the Battle of the Five Armies. Okay. I strongly agree. So I mean, there's still a lot. I think uh, this movie is actually going to be the most uh, time spanning. I think because you go, they're going to go meet. Beyond, right? The shapeshifter. They're gonna go through Mirkwood. They're gonna encounter the elves. They're gonna go to Lake Town. Uh, then encounter Smog. So this movie is probably gonna be the best of all three, I think. And it's the shortest one too. It, I think it's shorter than the first one. Oh really? Yeah, it's two and a half hours. I think the other one was closer to three. <laughs> yeah, it's it's 161 minutes, and the first one was. Um, hold on a second. Oops, Sorry. we lost somebody. The the first one was uh, oh it's 169 so it's eight minutes shorter so I thought it was shorter it'll, than that so it'll be it'll so. be going fast it'll be yeah it'll be fast. riding along yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing then, Bjorn in the second movie I mean um, have you seen the uh, the concept pictures for him I've no I've just seen the trailer and um, he, he was barely he in the looks, trailer look yeah but um, him as a man he looks like a caveman basically yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what he's supposed to be right. And uh, and Stephen Fry is gonna be like the master of Lake Town in the second movie as well. I'm looking forward yeah, to that. Yeah, that'd be good. Big fan of him. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to the uh, the smog Bilbo scenes. Like oh. I thought the riddles in the dark scenes were really good in in the first one, but I think the second one's gonna be really really good, especially because those two actors have such great chemistry already, just from uh, Sherlock. So it's gonna be. Oh, I know. Really good. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm looking through. I'm uh, looking forward to the Merkwood part of the thing. I hope they stretch it out. The, I mean, it's kind. Of, I think that's going to be the tricky part of the movie because if they spend too much time, it's going to be boring. But if they make it too quick, we are not going to get the suffering they went through as they were traveling through this thing, uh, their desperation and all that, uh, as they ran out of food and all that. So. Uh, it was pretty well written in the book when you know at nights they all they see our eyes of all these creatures around them and um, yeah, yeah I'm back. Hilly. Welcome back. <laughs> I mean I really hope that they don't like make the spider speak in the movie. I, I mean they didn't they do are. that. They didn't do that in the first movie. I mean the walks spoke I think and the eagles. So I think I'm safe on that part. I just yeah, really I hope they use stuff. a adder cop in there. Bilbo song. Yeah, me too. But they can find some way to like put it in there as a you know kind of like how Gandalf says out of the frying pan into the fire. I hope they do some kind of mm-hmm. not sweet to that. So. There, yeah, me too. And uh, there was one extra song in the extended edition, the uh, for unexpected journey, the, the uh, man in the moon one. Uh, it's the Goblin yeah, it King. A, yeah, they did the Goblin King oh, one. Too. They did two. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What's the, the man in the moon Goblin one? Cake. Um, it was the one in Rivendell. Uh, both. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. Sings it. That's right. I forgot about that one. But yeah, I like so, the Goblin King song. <laughs> so, what yeah, do you guys I'm... think about um, Legolas being in these movies? <laughs> Unnecessary. It's kind yeah. of expected. No, I, it's kind of expected. It, has, it I makes mean, it's, sense. It's the he's yeah. the biggest star, pretty much, from the first, you know, from the Lord of the Rings movies, and. You know he's from Mirkwood, so why wouldn't you put him in there? You know it's yeah. it's not like you we yeah, didn't see Strider come come in in Rivendale where they could have easily done that, but this one may, actually makes more sense. But I think it makes sense there, though. I think it makes sense story wise, you know, since that's where he's from, and one of his fathers, one of the main characters in the story. Well, 
not one of the main characters, but a significant character in the book. Yeah, I think that's definitely smart of them to do that because I mean, it makes sense that where, uh, he where, wasn't wh- like where, conceived the, at that point when they wrote the Hobbit. Yeah, okay. But it's just that the that the Wood Elves were such douchebags, right, towards the dwarves. <laughs> so so we're gonna have Legolas being the bad guy. So that's gonna be like you know, it's just out of place for uh, yeah. Well, well yeah, we, he, don't he know, st- we don't know if he will be the bad guy. Well, he, well he, definitely he's gonna be antagonistic. Yeah, I mean, they need to keep his sort of prejudice to, towards dwarves intact in this film so he can have that relationship with Gimli in the Lord of the Rings. I mean, he can't get whole buddy-buddy with them or it will sort of break the continuity. In the... Mm. I mean, it has to be Bilbo who rescues the dwarves, right? We can't, you can't have uh, Legolas helping Bilbo. Then it's going to, you know, no, he's not going to get the full credit then. Well, I think if anyone's going to help him, it might be Toriel. She seems uh, sympathetic to the dwarves in the previews. Yeah, I think it, Toriel will either by omission or by 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 actual helping, but she she'll probably help Bilbo in some way because I don't think Bilbo is going to be using the ring as much, and so if he's walking around visible, I could definitely see him running into Toriel and Toriel just saying, you know, go go or something. We're but, seeing something and just not saying anything. Yeah, or just seeing something. So. Yeah, you guys want to go into Toriel now, like her introduction as, the, as a character in this one, and or addition, really? Sure. I mean, Tor- so I always thought Toriel makes sense, again, because, you know, there's no female characters. And so putting in a warrior female character is, you know, got to be helpful for the for the thing. And if she, you know, she shows, you know, some kind of, if she's the ability to have some ca- kind of character arc for Legolas, then you know it definitely makes more sense. So. Yeah, I mean, she. I mean, this is besides the point, really. But she really looks like um, has that sort of same kind of look as Liv Tyler as Arvin in the first trilogy, really. I yeah. sort of see a similarity between the two. And I mean, they actually filmed some scenes where Arvin was gonna go to Helm's Deep and help Aragorn fight over there, but. They eventually scrapped those. I mean, they filmed the scenes and all, and I saw an interview with Liv Tyler about that, I think, but they tried to put that sort of badass elf woman warrior thing in the first trilogy, but I guess they're sort of making up for it here. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I hope she's really good because, um, you know, there's not. I don't think there's anything wrong with adding to the story as long as it's within the you know, kind of character of it. And I think... Adding a female wood elf actually seems really interesting. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, but they can't really take her relationship with Legolas too far uh, because he's single in the uh, Lord of the Rings and all that. I think it was uh, Michal on the forums predicted that Toriel is going to get killed in these films, yeah. to sort of give a uh, sort of emo- emotional thing for Legolas, so build his character up. Oh, I think it's without a doubt that she'll die at like the Battle of Five Armies or something. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, do you think there's going to be? Think, oh, go ahead. I, I think Radagas might die in one of these movies as well. I think what? it's uh, definite. You yeah, know because why? Um, if you if you notice, um, Gandalf's staff yeah. in The Hobbit is different from the one he carries in right. uh, Fellowship of the Ring, um, which actually looks a bit like Radagast's. Looks exactly like it. Yeah. But doesn't yeah. that break the continuity, really? I mean, in uh, Fellows of the Ring, Gandalf says that Radagast sort of directed him to Isengard to seek Saruman's um, counsel, in, where he in eventually the book. got captured. In, in the book. Yeah, I guess well, it's yeah. a different universe. Yeah. Um, he, he's not mentioned. I think well, that, what they were going to do was um, Peter Jackson was going to come in as Radagast origi- um, originally as a concept, <laughs> so they had him dressed up as Radagast. Um, without the bird poo. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Um, well, I mean, I... Yeah, they scrapped that. <laughs> yeah, he just sort of came as undignified for a wizard to me. I mean, um, there's that. I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't the wizards supposed to be like basically angels? That yeah. Sort of um, came yeah, down and... but they are spirits. But they're in mortal bodies, and they have mortal, I guess. Uh, What's I'm trying to say? Inclinations. I mean, yeah, and weaknesses. Yeah, I mean that line from Saruman that he's sort of like lost himself to indulging in too much mushrooms and weed or something. I mean, uh, I thought about like 
can they sort of lose themselves in their sort of carnal desires, I guess, I mean. Well, um, Sor- Gandalf does, does like that. the smoke of the pipe weed. Yeah. That's exactly what happened to Saruman. Well, maybe, depending on what you consider carnal, uh, you know, his, pow- his pride and his, yeah, pride and lust for power. Hmm. I mean, that sort of ties into maybe into what they're sort of the people they're used to interacting with. Wasn't it that Saruman was most used with men? He sort of had a good relationship, working relationship with men and Gandalf with the elves and Radagast with birds and beasts or something like that. So maybe Saruman sort of picked up the power lust from men over there. Could be. Mm. The reason uh, Peter Jackson mentioned in the commentary, the reason they didn't name the blue wizards, the two blue wizards, uh, they mentioned them but didn't call their names, was because they don't. all they have the rights to is for the books, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. None of the supplemental uh, books like Silmarillion or any of that, they don't have the rights to that stuff. No, it was like I don't quite remember their names. When the two blue wizards, they supposed to, supposedly went off to the east and just didn't do uh, anything. Yeah, they went off to the east. Um, Tolkien's actually a bit... He sent mixed messages for people who asked him what happened to them. Sometimes he said uh, they uh, they just failed. Um, he actually said Radagast failed as well. Um, but then he sort of, he might have changed his mind later on in his life. Hmm. Yeah, I think he might have insinuated they got corrupted by Saruman or something, too. Uh, corrupt, uh, corrupted or killed or something. Um, but yeah. I think later on he said, "Oh, they were working in the east. If if they weren't working in the east, um, uh, Sauron would have had more forces in the west. Yeah, it would have been even worse. Gondor. Yeah. Uh, how did uh, Radagast fail? I mean, he, I guess um, the enemy had walks and uh, like that, like that. No, I think he said he retreated. He sort of retreated and uh, becomes just, a non-player. Uh, yeah. Ah, he sort of like. Yeah, fell into complacency there. Like the animals too much. Ah, uh, whereas Gandalf sort of kept being the like the puppet master. Yeah. yeah. Right. But yeah, like you said, I mean, definitely, you know, Radagast is probably going to die, and so is Toriel. But you know, that's kind of you, you kind of have to expect Jackson to tie those tie those pieces apart together. So you know, when you when you consider all of the movies as a whole. Someone's not going to be like, hey, why didn't Radagast show up in Lord of the Rings, you know? So that could have been useful. So <laughs> I see their deaths kind of necessary just to tie it all together. Yeah. Well, I sort of mentioned before how I didn't like Radagast. <laughs> uh, but one scene that was probably my least favorite in the movie was the Thunder Giant scene where the mountains sort of came alive and yep. started throwing rocks at each other. I really, really didn't like that. The uh, robot. So, well, that robot. Was a bit lame. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, Matt, I think you mentioned earlier the sort of roller coaster stuff, like, uh, the sort of, it was maybe a little bit too sensational, or, like, the, some of the action was, they were, like, standing on a bridge, and the bridge sort of fell off, and, like, <laughs> dropped into a chasm, and then they were suddenly all right, I mean, that sort of action, it's just, for me, it doesn't really hold any interest or excitement, it's just sort of, oh, hey, they're doing these special oh, effects. You're going to love the barrel scene, then. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I think, though, that that... that a massive action scene. I think the two scenes, one's... Uh, going back to the dishes scene, I mean, one's kind of played for comedy and one's action, but I think it's the same... I mean, it's it's consistent, that those two scenes, with the action, I mean, you know? Yeah, I mean, it kind of seems like these dwarves are clumsy and stuff like that, but they're surprisingly agile, you know? It's uh, <laughs> They're being able to make tall leaps and stuff like that. I just feel like it's, necess- I mean, you know, eventually there's going to be a Universal Pictures, um, or Universal Studios theme park that's The Hobbit. And there's going to <laughs> the be, you know, ride. there's going to be, you know, the Goblin Goblin Town ride, and there's going to be the mountain ride. And, you know, at some point we just have to realize, you know, these, these movies are designed to make money. And I, I actually know kids that, you know, little, little six-year-olds, when you ask them what, what their uh, favorite part of the movie is, they say that it's, you know, that Rock'em Sock'em robot, you know, the, the mountain scene. And so, uh, you know, if it's a family film, you you got to add something for everyone, so. Yeah, I guess I'm not in target audience then, but I mean, those sort of scenes, they just, well, I have read the book, so I know any, nobody's going to die in there, but they just don't hold any suspense for me, really, yeah. I mean. Yeah. No, flashy right. action. Yeah. yeah. It's good for 3D. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So do you guys think um, in either in the in the last two movies if they'll ever actually make the tie between the Necromancer and Soren? Like, do you think they'll actually say have like um, Gandalf be like, "This is this is Sauron. This is really really bad." Or do you think um, it'll just? Yeah, I think you'll find that out in this movie. Hmm. Is the eye up in the previews? Oh, is there? Sort of like big flaming eye. That's yeah, the there's trailers. a. Well, I think also uh, the Ring Wraith connects it to Sauron. Also, yeah, yeah that was the Witch King, wasn't it? Yeah, the crown yeah. and all. Hmm. So I would say they probably will. And he was sort of just this sort of like uh, bald and hairless kind of guy, just a shadow like mannequin dude that materialized out of nowhere. There, it wasn't very specific. The Necromancer. Okay, I think uh, that's about it, right? Uh, shall we conclude the podcast? <laughs> yeah, it seems we've sort of run out of steam here, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody, uh, any, nobody wants to play the, uh, the <laughs> Sandpaper game, do they? <laughs> I think that's unnecessary Thanks. for this one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. yeah the this might be the first one that doesn't... Well, Galadriel. <laughs> 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 I'd marry Galadriel. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Well, you'd be like a pet to her, really. I mean, she lives like a thousand years, and you're just this I was little creature. I was watching those scenes, and it's just amazing what they do with her. Like, you never, like, she is so composed. Like, there's one part when she does the reveal, and they must have put her on this turntable kind of thing that, like, had her dress fully splayed out because she's just standing there perfectly straight, and she just rotates completely. 360 or 180 she doesn't move you know there's the perfect economy of movement and her dress is like completely splayed out perfectly the entire time it's really amazing like if you go back and you just pay attention to like how they treat her movement and her dress and everything is really i think it's really interesting so yeah i really noticed that sort of the curve on her dress over there as well yeah i mean that was i think it was on my third or fourth rewatch you know. <laughs> uh, something about that scene, actually, I thought about is, I mean, Saruman seems very sort of dismissive of all of Gandalf's these ideas that, hey, there's evil rising in Dol Guldur, and he's just like, no, there, there isn't, you're idiot, go away, everything is fine. I mean, was was he supposed to be in this way of the enemy at this point already, or was he like just an idiot? Yeah, um, like, yeah I think that was supposed about, to show that. Yeah. They talk about it in the appendixes, um, so... When when they when the necromancer starts popping up and uh, the greenwood turns to murkwood, uh, Gandalf is there and he's like, "We need to go take care of this. We need to go take care of this." And Sauron's actually during that time looking for the ring. He's looking in the in the river, so he's got people out there looking, and he doesn't want and he didn't want people to be in that general. He didn't want Gandalf to be in that area because if Gandalf found people looking for the ring. It would ruin Saruman's chances and stuff. And so originally he was very dismissive. And then when Sauron realized that the necromancer was Sauron, and he's like, well, I don't want Sauron to get the ring, so we need to go over there and, uh, you know, drive him out. And so, uh, but yeah, so, that, actually, that was really well played because that, that was a part of the appendixes. Oh, all right. So, I mean... I guess we don't have any sort of record of Saruman actually being good. He's always been this sort of self-centered kind of guy. Yeah. Well, even when you, I think it's in the Cimmerillion, not in the appendices, but even when they choose the five people to head over, um, Saruman is very, you, you can tell like he's set up. Proud. To feel, like he's very, yeah, he's very stuff. He's proud, um, bit full of himself. That sort of thing. So. Looks down on the, Gandalf, who will become Gandalf. Yeah. Gandalf is uh, actually doesn't want to go, doesn't he? He he doesn't feel he's up to the task, and he ends up being the the one that pretty much saves everybody. Yeah. Well, I think, and I think the reason why they convinced him to go was they were telling him that you know the Sorman was going, so they need someone to watch Sorman. So and Gandalf was like, "All right, fine, I'll go." So that kind of goes back to Tolkien's theme about uh, people, or the lesser people. Making the difference, like the hobbits, the people that don't want to have to do it, like Frodo. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um. Yeah. 
So I, I, I'm, I'm really excited for the movie. Is anyone, is it, is everyone else excited or? Does oh, anyone... oh yeah, absolutely, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I think it, I think this might be a sec- uh, a better second movie than uh, Two Towers, even though oh. the Two Towers is my probably my favorite of those movies. Really? Um, I, well, it's the one I w- watch the most, even though I'm uh, a bit dubious about the Faramir and the end thing. Yeah, mine what's as well. What, I really what, what, so. What's everybody's order of favorite movies of the four that are out? Oh, four? Oh, You're covering all three, mm-hmm. all, all of them together. Yeah, how does, yeah, including this and the Lord okay, of the Rings. Uh, Return of the King, um, Fellowship, um, Two Towers, Hobbit. Yeah, Two for ta- me, Hobbit. yeah, go ahead, Matt. Uh, I would say it was Two Towers. I love the Battle of the Hornburg. I love that battle. Um, and then probably Return of the King, Fellowship. It's hard, I, I guess Hobbit before the Fellowship. But the Fellowship is great because I love that Balrog fight so i don't i don't know it's really hard for me to judge i would have to say fellowship's my favorite i love the beginning with hobbiton uh and i love the end with aragorn and you know uh, boromir it's got a great screen death all them baseball si- baseball bat size arrows flinging into him that <laughs> keeps fighting uh, and then hobbit would be second and then probably return of the king and two towers Huh, interesting. I would go with two towers for me because that's when everything kind of started, you know, taking place and motion and everything. A battle for Helm Steep, that's in two towers, right? That's like the favorite uh, favorite yeah. siege, fortress kind of thing. I think that I played a game, uh, Lord of the Rings something. It's kind of like a strategy kind of game. And uh, they had a... Oh, hang on. It's on my shelf here. Yeah, and they had that uh, campaign, the siege map camp campaign with Helmsteep, and it was so well done. I think I played that over a lot. It's been a while though. And then um, the last movie, uh, you know, Battle for uh, Gondor, you know, that's a classic. Uh, and then at the end, when Aragorn leads them um, uh, to Mor to Mor Moria, uh, no, Mo- Mo- no crap, Mordor. Mordor. <laughs> <laughs> More uh, and uh, uh, so now Hobbit versus the Fellowship. Uh, I kind of have to put Fellowship above Hobbit. I don't know. I think just time has aged these movies really well. They they still look really good. It's kind of surprising that this is like a ninety nine movie or something, right? When you look at it these days, uh, yeah. So yeah, I, Hobbit comes last, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, I think I have some nostalgic glasses here, but I'm a bit of a traditionalist here, really. I mean, probably Two Towers, Return of the King, Fellowship of the Ring, and the Hobbit movie after that. Really love Rohan and all that stuff. Like, probably the Rohirrim, Rohirrim Judge on the Pelennor Fields is probably my favorite scene, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't I can't stop crying for that one. <laughs> it's just, it's just the, when the horn comes and they turn up and he's, and he's all like, yeah. I love that sort of, like, defiance against like the unbeatable odds sort of thing but um i actually prefer the sort of even witch king fight in the book though it's not uh, as good yeah but, yeah uh, actually uh most of us are probably signed up for the lord of the rings like the vok episodes that be nice <laughs> black. or i mean i know i am uh, but yes yeah, yeah, that's gonna come up soon yeah and yeah, we, Lee, will yeah. be on, Lee will be on with a better connection then, too. So. <laughs> yeah. But, but you, do you guys promise to come back when we do the the review for the second movie? Uh, that's going to come yeah. out here Is in the up? U.S. on uh, December 13th. So, uh, so we should try and uh, podcast uh, sometime after that. Mm, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to try and see that with my brother also to keep up with the tradition. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I can make it, yeah. Tell him that this one has dragon in it. Actually a dragon in it, and not just a dragon's <laughs> eye. And a great sounding yeah. one, too. Yeah. <laughs> the dragon sounds great. I can't wait for those scenes. No, no, I'll see it in theaters as long as we can find a babysitter. That, that's the problem. So mm. Hopefully I'll be able to see it in theaters. See, I have to wait till uh, the kids go to bed, and then I go by myself to the 10 o'clock show. <laughs> See, my wife Aww. wants to see it, too, so wow. it's harder for us to do that kind of thing. We actually didn't see the first Hobbit in the theaters because the babysitter came and then she just freaked out. So we couldn't go. So I actually didn't see it until it got home. But you what guys kind of kids do you have stuff. babysitter yeah. freaked out? No, the kid freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of babysitter you got? 
<laughs> no, she was a friend. She just uh, she was a l- she was little. She was six months, so oh. it was just oh, she did not want to go. So. Winter's coming. Got to grow up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh wow, that's like the only reference. No, that's like the second reference. <laughs> Song of Ice and Fire with it. <laughs> yeah, I tried to keep it up with Dothraki, but it was hard. All right, third. Okay. <laughs> wow, what's it? What's it, guys? It's reducing. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So, so you, I kind of wanted to ask. I so which is better, Songs of Ice and Fire or or Tolkien? You, uh, you can't compare sure. them. You can't. I can't compare them. Yeah. yeah, the two I they're I totally think, different. Yeah, it's like high fantasy and I don't know what do you call. Hmm. Song of Ice and Electrical Fire. Fantasy. Oh, Song of Fi- yeah. Ice and Fire has four knights, so I'm gonna go with that. I don't think there are any knights on Lord of the Rings. <laughs> you only have rangers and stuff. Rohirrim yeah. are all knights. Who are they? Yeah, but they're sort of like proto Vikings on horses. But I love that too. But yeah, I sort of go in for that sort of Arthurian myth. Knighthood okay. stuff that George is a lot of, yeah. Mm. So well, I don't know the, my classics. Song of Ice and Fire is over, then we'll decide. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know my classics really well, but is this the first time you had orcs and goblins and all these stuff? Uh, is, is, did Tolkien invent them or did somebody oh, no. did it before? Tolkien no, he's was a huge scholar, and so all of these, all of the everything he's taken from other places, but I think this is the first time they were kind of mainstreamed. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think like most cultures have that sort of like uh, goblin sort of thing. They call them elves, dwarves, trolls, whatever. Sort of this like spirit ugly thing in the woodlands that's sort of not a human or anything like that. But I think <laughs> Tolkien sort of uh, cemented the idea of an orc, this sort of human-sized monster. That's all bad and all that. I yeah, think that comes from yeah. Him. Elves and stuff like that who are like all, uh, you know, long aged yeah, and really good. All superior ligand. and all that. I mean, yeah, elves were probably like fairies before that mostly. Yeah. And, yeah, and dwarves are, are the greedy kind of side of humans or something. Yeah, the gold like living in the mountains and all that. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I mean, so, that. just for that, you guys, I mean, it spawns so much, right? I mean, there's the Warcraft movie, more Warcraft games and stuff like that. Every fantasy game ever out there uh, is all derived from this this thing. So speaking of orcs, did you like the uh, digital orcs or did you prefer the men in suit orcs from the original trilogy? Uh, I didn't notice much of a difference. I like the orcs in this film, but I especially like the walks. I mean, they look more wolf-like than in the two towers. Yeah, the wards are definitely better. Um, I guess the the orcs were. I felt like they were the same. I didn't realize that they were. were they all? Yeah, digital? yeah. I thought only Azog was the digital kind, just like Golem. Everybody else uh, was well, like they, makeup. They had a mixture of guys in suits and then um, and then uh, digital ones. Yeah, because Azog had to be really big, right? That's why they kind of did the CG thing with him. Yeah. In the commentary, Jackson said that he wanted the orcs to have more uh, inhuman like proportions in their skulls and in their skeletons, and that's why he went with them this time. Which, well, after reading that or after hearing him say that, I was kind of paying attention, and they, you can see uh, where they are. You can tell they're not men like uh, in the original trilogy, but I kind of, I kind of like the ones in the original trilogy too. Hmm. Yeah, I think they I like went a different Jackson. way with the goblins here. I mean, they're sort of more pale and malformed, sort of this drug the light, gave it dwelling, sort of yeah. uh, sort of deformed monsters. Whereas in the Fellowship of the Ring, they were sort of this, looked like roaches, basically. They had armor and all that, but yeah. no, they were wearing loincloths, looked a little bit like golem, really. Yeah, golems yeah. and, uh, go- I mean, goblins and ox didn't look too different in the f- in the first three movies. Here, it's, it was really noticeable. Cool. <laughs> I also liked how Jackson's been able to he kind of make tribes tribes of orcs and everything. So like how the the orcs in Mordor look different than the orcs in Moria, and how you know Azog's orcs, which are Gundabad orcs, are different and everything. So he he's d- done a good job at kind of like differentiating between the different kinds. So. Hmm. <laughs> Cool. I think uh, that's about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And um, yeah. <laughs> so hope, hope to see you guys again when we do a recap for the second movie. Uh, 
Okay, that's it then. Thank you. Bye. Right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Far over the misty mountains cold to dungeons deep. <laughs> that was the most awkward ending ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I was trying to remember what do we need to plug something or I nothing. Right? There's no podcast <laughs> yeah. awards. Yeah, the watch mode uh, is over and all that. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, do, I do, you, do you guys want to plug something? Your your blogs and your twitters or something like that, or any upcoming podcasts you are interested in? Nah, not really. Nah, no. the people who listen to this probably don't need the plugs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of like long, awkward pauses in this one, so you'll have a good time editing this, I think. Oh, and, do you uh, guys think the Necromancer is equal to Saruman thing we did is really spoiler? Because I didn't had no clue, but do you guys think a book reader would know that Saruman was the Necromancer? A book reader sure, right? would know. Oh, it. Okay. Well, I assume you know. Maybe no, I'm going to leave it. I just want to. Okay, yeah, I'm going to then extend the spoiler to uh, pretty much everything. <laughs> spoiler yeah, alert, like, uh, this this podcast spoils everything, every published book <laughs> in the universe. <laughs> no, no, I don't think we spoiled anything in the Song, song of Ice and Fire or anything. <laughs> Go for get the haircut, but yeah, so maybe just the book and the movie, yeah. <laughs> Do that. Yeah, you should say there's no spoilers for Song of Ice and Fire and just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Oh, you wanted... Yeah, Lord of the Rings spoilers. Yeah, we got those. I mean, yeah. I mean, two I people I... who have only seen the movies. Like, mm. is anyone going to be surprised when Thorin and Philly and Achilles die? I mean, that's just. I mean, well, I'm telling so. that to my friends who haven't read the book. Yet, but I guess <laughs> I'm just a terrible person. But yeah. Oh, I I don't think anybody would care if one among the twelve dwarfs dies. If Bomber dies, nobody's going to be like, oh no. <laughs> oh, I mean, as I. Said earlier, Philly and Killy are sort of the hot drop dwarves here. That <laughs> the sexy dwarves that I think the like ladies care about the most here. <laughs> I haven't put on Tumblr, but I think it's probably pretty blatant over there. Uh, I think uh, there's probably a lot of people just in the movie general going public probably doesn't know, but people that are downloading podcasts and you know, I think most of those people would probably be yeah. privy to that info. No, I Sounds think we, like the books we haven't have... been out for 50 years or something. <laughs> 50, uh, 1937, right? This came out. <laughs> so, yeah, that is. So that's that's 76 years. So. Yeah, that's, that's enough. <laughs> Uh, hey Vikram, thanks for taking over. Um, oh no, no. I mean, uh, you know, I I wasn't too keen because I'm not, as you guys saw, I'm not really a pro at this. I'm not really, <laughs> you know, really only know the movies and except for the Hobbit, and don't, don't know much about anything else. I think it's just because it's so kind of high fantasy is not really my thing. I'm more the sci-fi yeah. thing. So. So I wanted one of you guys to kind of be the, uh, you know, kind of lead the discussion around. It's a shame we lost Lee. I mean, he, yeah, he had shit yeah. together. But, oh, yeah. I mean, Matt, you had a lot of, like, talking knowledge to crap on as well, as well so yeah. props for, to you for that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Lee, Lee, I think, has, Lee, I think, knows a little bit more than I do. But, uh, oh, yeah. I've, yeah. I'm, I've been racing through all the books trying to, like, re-remember everything. So. Uh, do, you, do then you listen to the Tolkien Professor podcast? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I guessed you might because you had lots of points that I wouldn't bring up as well. Yeah, that, that was one of the things. It's like I was trying to like I've been as when I was preparing for this, I was like, "Am I thinking this, or is this just because you know Tolkien professor said it?" So, <laughs> yeah. but a lot of the things he says, especially about adaptation, or, I guess there's a plug. Go listen to Tolkien professor; it's really good. Yeah, um, the latter, yeah. Yeah, what? but. Uh, <laughs> But like his his whole thing on adaptation, I think is really good. It really helped me with the uh, with uh, Game of Thrones versus A Song of Ice and Fire as well, where you just have to accept them as two different things and not get not get all riled up about. Because <laughs> when someone teaches Tolkien, you know, for his you know that's his livelihood, and he's not getting riled up about changes in a movie, you kind of have to think, well. You know, maybe this doesn't matter as much as I think it does. So, mm. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, with Tolkien, I guess there's there's just have been so many clones out there, right? So many variations on the dwarf, so many variations on the elf. I guess kind of you become immune to it or something. Yeah. 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 My dwarves pretty much stay the same in every fantasy thing. My, I mean, they're just. To say my dwarf <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say my dwarf credentials are my uh, Dragon Age origin character. <laughs> the dwarf. Uh, Roshgar, uh, a Duken. Oh, same here. Uh, my my World of Warcraft character for the longest time I was a dwarf hunter. So. <laughs> 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 That's why I was I was so when I read this book I related to it so well and I was just could see myself in the party. <laughs> All right, I gotta get okay. out of here. Yeah, I gotta Thank go. You. Thank you, Shane. Thank All you, right. Matt. See ya. Thanks, really Thanks for coming on, guys. Okay, then bye. 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 And caverns old The pines were roaring On the height The winds were moaning In the night The fire was red It flaming spread Like torches blazed with light.